For decades, Hertz was the nation's number one provider of rental cars. Then in 1995, Enterprise took over that number one position, but Hertz has been following directly behind. In 2019, people in the US spent a total of $32 billion on rental cars, and almost $7 billion of that was spent at Hertz, so what's that, about a fourth or fifth of the market? They are big outside of the US too. Between all of their brands, they have over 12,000 locations located in North America, Europe, Latin America. America, Africa, Asia, Australia, the Caribbean, the Middle East, and New Zealand. The main reason I'm making this video is because in May of 2020, they couldn't pay their debts and were forced to file for bankruptcy. It's looking like they will survive through it with different owners, but this is a big deal. And the most direct and obvious cause of this would be the pandemic. Airlines have been some of the most affected, and considering 76% of Hertz transactions are traditionally from airports, that puts them in a tough position. Plus, their busiest seasons are typically spring and summer, so the virus came at the worst possible time for them and impacted the worst possible industries. I can't deny it's been impactful, but I will argue that there is much more to it. Things were going bad for Hertz well before 2020. For one, they have not been performing well on the stock market. They have done considerably worse than the rest of their industry and the rest of the market in general. In 2014, their price was reaching over $100 per share, while they ended 2019 at around 15. Also, over that time, they have not been the most profitable either, losing money four of the last six years, resulting in a net loss of over $250 million. And a big reason behind that would be their billions of dollars in interest that they paid over that time from their now $17 billion in debt. Again, I want to point out that all of these numbers are before any impact from the virus. So today, I want to take a look back while painting the full picture of what happened to Hertz. You know, this is one of those companies where the ownership of it seems to be bounced around like that basketball scene in Flubber. Over the last hundred years or so, for various reasons, massive companies have been buying and selling Hertz. The name Hertz comes from John Hertz. At this point, I think his name being attached to one of the largest car rental companies has proven to be the way most of us remember him, but he did so much more. In 1904, he was a newspaper reporter for the Chicago Morning News when the company went through a merger and he was laid off. Despite not being able to drive, he quickly found a job selling used cars, which led him in a promising direction. Three years later, he obtained seven used cars that he transformed into taxis that would transport people across the city. Then in 1915, he incorporated the business as the Yellow Cab Company of Chicago, and I thought this was interesting. It was called that because he had 40 taxis by now and wanted to make sure that they were all painted a very noticeable color. He went as far as paying for a scientific study to figure it out which resulted in the color yellow. I guess he wasn't the first to have yellow taxis, but he did it very early and in a big way and is thought to be part of the reason why they're still typically yellow today. Yellow, much like the Hertz logo. Now, in 1918, we have another guy named Walter Jacobs, who much like Hertz, started as a young used car salesman in Chicago that started a business utilizing those used cars. But instead of taxis, Jacobs chose to start a car rental business. It started with only 12 cars, but after five years, it grew to a respectable 600. Somewhat confusingly, that business is actually what became Hertz. So the founder and original owner is Walter Jacobs. Just stick with me here. By 1923, the Yellow Cab Company was successful enough to purchase this rental car company. So John Hertz is actually the second owner. It's named after him because once he took over, he changed the name of it to Hertz Drive Yourself System. That name was a way to point out the difference. The cabs would drive you, but then the rental cars, you would drive yourself. Three years later, Hertz sold the rental car company along with some other stuff that he owned to General Motors. And then a little later, he sold the rest of his cab company as well. But there's more to it. See, GM held on to Hertz and successfully grew the company for the next 27 years until 1953 when they sold it to Omnibus. They were primarily a bus company that was started and still ran by John Hertz. So after the acquisition, Omnibus divested everything else they owned, making rental cars their entire business and changed their name to Hertz. So oddly enough, John Hertz was not the original owner, but he was the second 
and the fourth owner. And the fifth owner is more shocking than I think any of them. In 1967, believe it or not, Hertz was bought by RCA. They are traditionally a radio and electronics company, but right around this time, they had this strategy where they would expand by getting involved in everything. They bought a frozen food company and a publishing company and a rental car company. I wouldn't say too much happened under their ownership, but I do want to mention that it was during this time when they signed an endorsement contract with a popular football player named OJ Simpson. Which, of course, today we better know him from his murder trial and other craziness, but in 1975, people loved him and it resulted in a very successful campaign that lasted for about 20 years. He would be in commercials where he would famously run through the airport and studies showed that they helped the brand become more recognizable and more well-liked. Hertz remained a subsidiary of RCA for 18 years until they ultimately decided that it was time to get back to basics and they needed to get rid of all these unrelated companies. So in 1985, RCA sold Hertz to United Airlines, which made more sense. See, United Airlines was on their own mission of becoming an all-encompassing travel company. For a brief time in the 1980s, they owned an airline, of course, a hotel chain, a car rental company, and significant portions of multiple travel agencies. But it was only two years before United Airlines decided that there wasn't much advantage to this super travel company that they had created and decided that it would be smarter to separate the various businesses and get rid of everything except their airline. This meant that they would be selling Hertz, this time to Ford. Well, technically they sold it to a newly created company called Park Ridge Corporation that would be 80% owned by Ford and 20% owned by managers from Hertz. Some minor changes happened, but in 2001, Ford did become 100% owner. This meant that Hertz would now be purchasing a tremendous number of cars from Ford. They were already buying a lot of them, and now it was even more. Throughout the 1990s, it was well over half. In fact, going back to OJ, do you know that infamous slow-speed car chase with the Ford Bronco? OJ has said that that car was actually a rental from Hertz, which would make sense. All right, let's just finish up this list so we can get back to the bankruptcy. In 2005, Ford sold it to some private equity firms, and the following year, they became a public company. Looking at their balance sheet, at the end of 2019, again, well before they were impacted by the virus, Hertz reported total assets of nearly $25 billion, most of which was tied up in vehicles. Of that $25 billion, less than $1 billion of it was available in cash. On the bottom half of the balance sheet, they had far more debt than equity. The ratio was above 12, and the important number being the $17 billion in debt. If you were a creditor deciding whether or not you should lend them money, these are some of the first numbers you should be looking at, and they would tell you to be careful because Hertz was at a high risk of not being able to pay it back. And if you're wondering where all of this debt came from, I can tell you. Just yearly losses haven't been helping the situation. If you're not prepared for the debt, it has a way of just getting worse and worse. And then in 2011 and 2012, they made a couple of acquisitions that complicated things. They bought this fleet leasing company called Donlin that added $770 million of their debt. Then the following year, they acquired a value car rental company called Dollar Thrifty for $2.3 billion. And we can also point to those changes in ownership. Whenever a company is being bought and sold like this, you know that they're picking up some some debt along the way. For example, when Ford first became involved in the 1980s, that transaction alone added almost $800 million in debt. There's more to it, but I think that $17 billion figure is starting to make sense. These are all of your typical red flags that we see on this channel all the time, but there's some more layers to this that are specific to how Hertz ran their business. Of this $17 billion in debt, over $13 billion of it is categorized as vehicle because most of it is in the the form of asset-backed securities that are in fact backed by their fleet of vehicles. All right, I know that got confusing, so I'm gonna do my best to keep it simple. As I said, most of their assets are tied up into their vehicles. They rent out over half a million of them in the US, an additional 200,000 of them internationally, meaning they literally own billions of dollars worth of cars. So when Hertz needs to borrow money, they essentially put up those vehicles as collateral. They convince the potential lenders by saying, hey, if we don't pay back this loan, you can take our cars. There are some more steps and details to it, but that's the main idea. Well, once the pandemic hit, the used car market was one of the many that slowed down. People were saving their money instead of buying them, so the dealerships were logically slowing their purchases, and the lack of demand caused the prices to drop. The average value of a used car dropped something like 10 to 
12% in the month of April. And when you own over 700,000 used cars, that can be trouble. The lender said, hold on a second, we don't feel good about this because that collateral is no longer valuable enough to cover what you owe us. They told them when you borrowed the money, you agreed that you would maintain a certain ratio there, so we're going to need you to pay up that difference. Considering their sales were down 73% compared to the year before and they had very little cash on hand, they couldn't do it. As it turns out, and you may have known this, it's hard to continue operating a business with little money, little sales, high debt, and decreasing asset values. When you combine all of these factors, they had to file for bankruptcy. I guess the best way to summarize it is by saying this bankruptcy is a result of both controllable and uncontrollable factors. The bottom line is that they made some risky decisions. If things had gone differently, if the pandemic never happened, maybe they would have been fine, but I like to think that I would have been a little safer. Like, say, in 2012, instead of spending billions of dollars on competitors, maybe they could have paid off some of that debt. Let me know in the comments, what do you think of Hertz? They are an old company with a crazy history, so it's sad to see them like this. Do you think they'll come back strong or continue to struggle? And in your opinion, what went wrong at Hertz? Of all the stuff that I mentioned or something else, what was the most impactful and what needs to happen for them to recover? I'd like to hear what you have to say. Thank you for watching.